friends, welcome to the Ransom Tart Podcast. I'm Alan Arnold, and I hope as you hear this that you are healthy. I hope that you are navigating these uncertain times with a sense of peace that can only come from God. And we are going today to enter into the conclusion of our series on Expecting the Wonderful. Now, we started that a while back, but the last two weeks, we felt it was most important to bring you some ideas, some thoughts from John on how to navigate a world where it seems like in just a short amount of time, everything has changed. So if you haven't listened to the first two parts of Expecting the Wonderful, you'll want to do that before listening to the conclusion today. You might even want to do that even if you heard them when they first came out, because that's been several weeks ago. In today's session, John, Blaine, and I talk about active, practical ways that we can expect the wonderful. What are ways to get our focus off of the eternal now that our culture seems trapped in? And how do we actively find ways to experience the kingdom and our anticipation of it here today in real ways? So here's the conclusion of our series, Expecting the Wonderful. Friends, welcome back to the Ransom Tower podcast, a third installment this week in a series on how do you live at the end of the age? How do you navigate such a time as ours, which I've been describing as pretty rough on the human soul, the collection of the chaos and the overwhelming news that we're exposed to and then the dark spirits that are rampaging the earth, kind of the lack of any personal margin anybody has anymore. How do you navigate a time like that? How do you live consciously at the end of the age? So with me this week, Blaine again, and Alan Arnold joining the conversation this time. So welcome, guys, into this. Thanks. How do you live at the end of the age? How are you seeing people live at the end of the age? Well, my observation of people, and too often myself, is this gravitational pull toward life is hard, and so I want things to be easy and efficient, and I want immediate gratification for whatever desires or work I do. You know, I see a lot of offense and rage whether it's when you're driving home on the interstate or in politics or whatever it may be, just this sense of I've got to get whatever I'm going to get now. And so the end of the age, I think the feeling is time is short, but it doesn't tend to create a hope for the future, but more of an immediate panic and urgency for the now. Mm. Yeah, that's right on, Alan. I think it is appropriate right now that as we're recording this podcast, the fear turbines are at full speed relative to global pandemics, the coronavirus. Yes. My goodness. We are in an election year, which just those two things together show me how situated in the right now I am. All of these are immediate existential threats to a fragile happiness. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if these things were actually signs of the return of Jesus? Not that you would celebrate them, but that you could see them in context of, Mm -hmm. if this meant we were that much closer to Jesus coming back, how wonderful. The only solution to mortality. Right? And to every other heartache in the world. Yeah. Yeah, how do you live at the end of the age, friends? Well, the first question is, how are you living at the end of the age? I mean, just to be honest, kind of take a quick look at, is it mostly kind of that combination of hunker down, Mm -hmm. survival mode, you know, just sort of always on your guard, and then get what you can, like get a little bit of joy in, you know, drink a little bit too much, eat a little bit too much, binge watch your shows, you know, plan that next trip, daydream. Daydream in very appropriate ways, daydream in some inappropriate ways. You see that? Like that hunker down in fear and then try and get a little bit of joy. And it does feel fragile. 
Psalm 1 is where I've been hanging out because I'm just so intrigued by those folks who are like trees planted by a riverbank whose leaf never withers. I'm like, oh gosh, I want that. Mm. I want that. And the folks who are completely taken out by the world, they are described as chaff, that the next breeze blows away, that the next piece of bad news, the next turn of events. I don't think that that is what God has for us. I think that he has wonderful things for us, even at the end of the age. I think we are meant to be those trees. So as we've been unpacking in the first two installments in this conversation, how do you live at the end of the age? Well, among a number of things, you live expecting the wonderful, not expecting doom and disaster. Right. Or you live at least with expectations. Like, I feel like in most cases, wonderful is a very high bar to clear. Whereas simply expecting a future that God is interested in, Mm. that's more than many of us have margin for. Mm -hmm. To begin to address that and look forward and eventually situate yourself in a very big story. Mm. And then you can sort of add the wonderful reality that the future is good. Yeah. 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 For me, hopelessness is a natural occurrence if I am passive or reactive. In other words, if I'm not actively pursuing hope, hopelessness is the default, and it comes in little by little, maybe through agreements or maybe through just a a sense of loss or a sense of, man, this is hard. And so what I found is if I just go through my day expecting to be hopeful, Mm -hmm. it's not going to happen any more than if I would expect my biceps to grow without ever doing any workout Mm. or without ever putting Mm. any time in the gym or wherever. And so one of the things for me, it's how do I actively try to court and run after and pursue hope? There you go. Because it won't just show up in the morning or in the evening. It's worse than that, Alan. I really do think that all of the antidepressant and anxiety drug increases and the suicide rates and all that, I think that Blaine called it total war When you live at the end of the age, you're living in an environment of total war. And personally, the state of being experience is like a riptide. If you've Mm. ever been to the coast and waded out in areas where the little yellow flags or the red flags are out, and you feel the, holy cow, this current is really strong. And I just have to brace myself simply to maintain. Yes, it's the difference of... (laughs) If I don't take care of my house, it will slowly break down versus if I'm not currently vigilant, it will immediately catch on fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so out of mercy, friends, uh, this, this whole conversation is born out of mercy. I do think that hopelessness is one of the enemy's tactics right now on the earth. I do think it's rampaging. And it's actually good to know that. So then you go, oh, it's not just me. It's not, oh, I just thought that that was my personal struggle. I just mm-hmm. thought that that was my my point of vulnerability or my lifelong battle. Or because of, you know, some terrible turn of events, that's just where I am now. But in kindness, one of the things that's so helpful about spiritual warfare is when you go, wait, that's not me? It's actually quite relieving to go, ah, I just thought I was the disaster. Yeah. So I do think that there is an onslaught of hopelessness, and and we want to combat that in very intentional ways, like Alan was saying. So, Romans 8, in this hope, we were saved. In this hope, we were saved. Hebrews 6, 19, we have this hope as an anchor of the soul. And then Paul, as he makes that shift into talking about the future in Romans 8, he says, you know, what we suffer now, so there's the honesty about the now, is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. All creation is waiting eagerly for that future day. And it says, with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children 
in glorious freedom. For we know that all creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present moment, and we also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste, for we want to be released from sin and suffering, and so we too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his children, including the new bodies he has promised us. He says we wait for it patiently and confidently. Don't we, though? (laughs) Nailed it, Paul the Apostle. (laughs) I want to. I want to. So that's the direction we're headed. I I don't think we can get there without making some conscious efforts towards it. And one of the points we've been making, and you can't anchor the soul in, in a hope that's vague. But what I also wanted to say this week is you can't anchor the soul, you can't combat the dark force of hopelessness on the earth right now with something that is vague or something that is weird. So can I just say, all weirdness has to go. Hmm. Anything you've been told, taught, read, heard, heard in a song, maybe heard in a worship song that's weird, it's got to go because that will not combat hopelessness. You know, oh, I just can't wait to dance on the streets of gold. Because it's just weird. It's just weird. Come on. It's just weird. That's not helpful. Yes. Right. There's a current worship song that, it must be said, I actually really like. But there are a few lines in it that are about the beauty of Jesus that when I stopped and considered them, were like that, where it's, you know, we know your eyes are like flames of fire. We know your hair is white as wool. No, white as wool. Yeah, it's never snow in the Bible. <laughs> there is hail. <laughs> Jesus, you're beautiful. And I went, wow. Well, form and content. The form is telling me about the beauty of Jesus because yeah. this is a beautiful song. Yeah, but it's like we know. But in Daniel chapter 7, they use the image of white wool to display the dazzling radiance of God, but your hair is really not white because that would be weird. (laughs) And we know that your eyes are like fire, but actually you have human eyes that see like ours do. And they're loving and piercing. Well, okay, so can we just, quick footnote, the book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature. Okay, so no, his hair is not white. That's wall. No, his eyes are not blazing like fire. Though when you look into them, you will find blazing passion. You will find blazing love. So the point being— You mean Jesus doesn't have a tongue sword? Yeah, yeah, right. (laughs) The sword coming out of his mouth and all that. Guys, come on. It's apocalyptic literature. It's not helpful. But it is helpful in making the point. Friends, it can't be weird. Like, don't go weird on the future. Don't, like— Make it weird or accept weirdness because it won't combat hopelessness. And most people are trapped in the eternal present. Mm -hmm. We are trapped and suffocating in the now because of this poverty of imagination. So what we wanted to do here in installment three was combat that a little bit um, by showing you some of the ways that we are combating it. And I am recommending, so, you know, here's cards on the table. What we're suggesting that you do, friends, is like, start a journal. Start some place that you begin to record things. You know, when, for me, I I mentioned the end of The Rise of Skywalker, the latest Star Wars movie, and the joy of evil overthrown and the freedom of the universe from darkness, and everyone's running around hugging everyone else, and then Blaine, the narrative you wrote and read to us about the magnificent procession into the New Jerusalem and the coronation of Jesus, you use that phrase, you could run into every set of open arms. So I'm looking in movies, songs, literature, in nature, I'm looking for things that help my heart begin to fill that file folder, fill that empty journal in the soul. So how are you guys doing it? How and where are those moments coming to you? I think one thing that's interesting and important is that the things that were helpful a year, two years ago, when I go back to them, really aren't. And sort of to name that the ongoing practice of expectancy here, just to go, wow, mine are very fresh. And a year ago, it would be 
the trailer two years ago, be the trailer to the second planet Earth and the score. I could listen yes. to the music on its own. Yes. And right now, some funny ones that have surprised me of sudden expectation and hope in the restoration of all things would be Kanye West's Jesus is King album. Actually, a lot of Kanye West's album. Kanye, if you're out there. And marching band music. And the reason why... You mean like... <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Seriously. So Marching band music. Marching band music. Okay, stay with us, folks. This is going somewhere good, because I know my son, but you, you got to get us there. Well, first of all, it, we're not talking that tune that you just hummed, stirring, though it was. <laughs> uh, we're talking about what do you play when the team is about to rush onto the field and to let what is rising in me tell me about God's heart because suddenly there is this fierce, prepared uh, confidence in an undertaking that happens to be a football game that maybe I'm watching. Uh, Nonetheless, I go, oh, wow, hang on, wait just a second. And Kanye West's music has been doing it because I go, you know, the problem with the voice of the oppressed is that that's never perfected in human form, right? We're all oppressed and oppressor. But to go, the voice of the oppressed is actually telling you about God's heart of justice. And it's like, well, the indignation you are representing right now, Kanye, is actually perfected in the justice of Jesus mm. over evil and going, wow, what is your what? Is your heart for the restoration like and feeling his passion to come back being represented in a marching band Mm. and in hip-hop music, but letting it unfold a little bit and paying attention, and Mm. I've been loving it. Wow. Wow. That's really good. Yeah. I've been drawn. You were talking about music. For me, it isn't marching bands, although I heard you this morning, the halls were filled with marching band music. I missed this. And did it do anything and for you? I started marching <laughs> <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> um, but I have found I'm drawn. What's really stirring my heart now is music without lyrics. So whether that is symphonies or whether that's jazz or movie scores, like when there's words, it almost is too constricting. So when I'm listening to music with somebody else's words, I'm trying to listen to their thoughts. And it's just been a season for me lately of I want to open my mind Mm. and my heart, and I want to be stirred without hearing these words coming in in a song. Mm. So that's been super helpful, especially movie soundtracks. So older ones, Braveheart, River Runs Through It, to Star Wars, to the old and the new riffs on that. But just classical scores have been helping a lot. And another thing I've been doing recently, which is a little bit more into the creative imagination realm, but I'll find myself going out, sitting down outside, and just closing my eyes. But instead of trying to pray, I just see myself with Jesus at a fire pit, and a conversation begins. And I just let that go. Mm. And wherever God wants to take it, not only is it a great way to hear from Him, But it's also a great way to get this taste for, I want this to really happen, and it will in the kingdom, Mm. in a tangible, visceral way, where now it's more imagination and it's more asking God to hear his words. But that gives me a taste of wonder in the moment and a longing for, Mm. what's the kingdom going to be like when we can just do this Mm. with Jesus, with people from the past, with whoever? Yeah. When Jesus told me this was all born out of a conversation, when I I simply asked him, how do we live at the end of the age? And he was the one to use the phrase, expecting the wonderful. And so I began this back in the writing of All Things New, of course, because I was thinking about it, reading on it, letting my heart go there. And I began to ask Jesus to show me the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And if you'll read All Things New, a number of the chapters have a prelude to them, which is a kind of vision that God gave me about the coming kingdom. 
so that's one direction. Another direction I've been doing is sitting and just letting my heart describe what I hope for, what I long for. And so the other night, it was around horses. And you heard the earlier podcast that we lost a horse that was incredibly precious to us and how hard it's been to just have one now. And and then read an article in a magazine by a, by a writer, Tom Reed, about hunting with horses. I thought, wow, he's a really good writer. I want to see what he's written and picked up his book, Give Me Mountains for My Horses. And I'm going to read this because for me, this captures letting my heart go towards the wonderful. What will the kingdom actually be like? And again, remember, again, we've been talking about tangible, practical, real, the concrete, not wispy, vague, or so hyper-spiritual it's weird. So with that, the short story is entitled The Partnership, and he's describing what it's like to have horses in the mountains, and it goes like this. There is a taste to this place, this time. Nothing is behind you. Everything is ahead. But you don't really think about what is ahead. You only think of now. For this partnership you have entered into is one of the moment of now. Now has you in a saddle, on a bay horse, heading up a trail of pines and spruce and mountain, of stream and meadow. Behind you, connected by only your hand and a lead rope, but carrying everything important to you is another bay horse, an almost identical match to the one you are riding. You call them nicknames as if they were human compadres, drinking buddies. You cluck and coo and talk to them. They are stepping out, heads nodding, down the trail and through the stream, and all you have to do is ride. So you ride. That evening, you make camp. It is a good place, with room for the horses and the broad, deep, green meadow, and camp back against the lodge poles, and your kitchen down a ways. So you ease off the bay's back and stretch your muscles with that stiff, good, worked hard feeling. And you begin to unload the pack horse, talking to him, thanking him. In a while, he has on the hobbles and is out there with his buddy, snorting contentedly in the tall grass and swishing a long coal black tail. The tent goes up quickly, and a meal down on the gravel bar. There's the sound of a night hawk chirping and peeling through the dimming sky, and all is well with the world. This is the world. You haven't thought about anything but this world, and you don't even think about not thinking about that other world. At dawn you rise in the cool air and soak it in, a cup of coffee steaming in your palm, and you watch the horses. You turn an ear to the sound of sandhill cranes from somewhere down the meadow. As the day warms, you work fluidly and quickly. Everything has a routine. The packing, the padding, hefting and weighing. You turn out of camp and saddle the horses. It feels good to be on a horse headed into wild country. It goes like this for days. The ride, the squeak of saddle leather, the smell of dust, the taste of it on your tongue, the smell of horse sweat and your own the soft muzzles nuzzling you after a long day. Good camp after good camp. One evening, a big grizzly and her cub cross a meadow far out ahead. The next morning, a moose walks the same path. Another day, you cross the Yellowstone on horse. Your feet get wet because the river is slow and wide and deep. The days melt away in the summer heat of the high mountain sun. You catch fish and see elk and ride for miles. There are beautiful places with names that sing to you and places without names just as beautiful. You see more moose. There's a wolf track in the mud and you ride. For me, like that... Like that is a tangible narrative of a real experience I fully expect to have exactly like that on the new earth. 
because the animals are there, the new earth is restored, you are a human being, and it's not weird. It is life restored. Well, it makes me want to be there too. Like it, there's so much tangible, tactile, exactly. the steaming coffee, the tracks and the yes. mud, yeah. the the scent, the smell, the sounds. Like that brings me to a real place and a real desire. That yes, it's happening in some ways on Earth now, but in the kingdom, I want my desires to be that real. Exactly. So, guys, here's. A reading from Proverbs 8, and uh, it's the message translation. It's about lady wisdom. But listen to these words, because this is the kind of thing I would long and love to see when I'm in the kingdom. So it's Proverbs 8, starts at 23, and lady wisdom is talking. It says, God sovereignly made me the first, the basic, before he did anything else. I was brought into being a long time ago, well before Earth got its start. I arrived on the scene before ocean, yes, even before springs and rivers and lakes, before mountains were sculpted and hills took shape. I was already there, newborn, long before God stretched out Earth's horizons and tended to the minute details of soil and weather and set sky firmly in place. I was there. When he mapped and gave borders to the wild ocean, built the vast vault of heaven, and installed the fountains that fed ocean, when he drew a boundary for sea, posted a sign that said, no trespassing, and then staked out earth's foundations, I was right there with him, making sure everything fit. Day after day, I was there with my joyful applause, always enjoying his company, Delighted with the world of things and creatures, happily celebrating the human family. Oh, see, what that opens for me is what we were talking about last time of there's so much of God's world that we don't know. Yes. And because it all got broke, we won't have a chance to know now. Mm -hmm. But to think about knowing it and exploring it, right? to go back and see it. And see its wonders and see its mysteries and explore the intimate as well as exploring the epic. Right. Like you said, to not just read it and go, wow, that must have been cool. But to say, I get to see that one day. I get to be a part of that one day. There's going to be new creations Mm -hmm. in the new kingdom and in the coming kingdom. And and we get to be a part of that and not just observe it, but... Mm -hmm to dance in it and enjoy his company and to watch it Mm. and to be part of it, that's breathtaking to me. Mm. Yeah, it sparks another one for me when it comes to what are the kinds of things that God enjoys doing that we can anticipate being a part of? One of my favorite sections anywhere is final chapters of Job and God's response and some of the things that he says he's up to are wild and concrete, but different. (laughs) For example, have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have you seen the gates of deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? What is the way to the abode of light? Where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Mm. Have you entered the storehouses of snow or seen the storehouses of hail, which I reserve for times of trouble? What is the way to the place where lightning is dispersed or where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Mm. He goes on. You go, that all sounds great to me. (laughs) I want to see that. I want to, the abode of... Yeah. Light, I mean, this yeah. is yeah. requires us to consent with our imagination. But as soon as we do, it's kind of like, oh, that isn't wispy. That's like a thing that you are up to and that we could go with you. And Yes. Combining those two, it reminds me of that beautiful part of McDonald's, George McDonald's line. He's envisioning our creativity in the coming new earth when we have creative powers that the sons and daughters of God were meant to have before the brokenness got in, and then some, 
right? Right. St. Peter walked on the water, as Lewis points yes. out. And one day we will have a creation that is infinitely obedient to the sons and daughters of God. McDonald goes, when we are in our home, our natal home, and from your love and peace no heart will roam, what if thou will make us able to create like thee, to paint golden sunsets, right? To hang yellow moons over a rose and purple sea, like the powerful creativity of the new creation in us in it. Yes. And then sometimes it's just very simple lines. I could have chosen a dozen things today to bring in. Sam and Frodo, deep in Mordor, darkness, dust, death all around them, nothing green growing. They are close to the end of their quest, and they are wiped out. And they're reminiscing a little, or Sam is, and Sam's doing it on purpose because he's trying to engender hope. And he says, do you remember strawberries and cream, Mr. Frodo? Early in the spring when they're ripe and the cream is rich. Early in the morning. Just like that. Yes. Just lines like that will do us. Like, oh, strawberries and cream in the kingdom. Right? And the richness of that. Or at the end of at the end of Lewis's first novel in the Space Trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet, the character has been taken hostage and taken into outer space. And he's finally made it back to Earth against all all odds, and, and his flight back to the Earth through space is a very cold and bleak and difficult thing, and the spaceship crash lands, and he gets out. Remember where this is going? Oh, I'm with you. Oh, it's so good, because the first thing, it's rain. He gets out of the spaceship, and it's raining, mm. and he hasn't felt rain on his body for months and months and months of his captivity in the weird, Okay. And so he's letting the rain just soak him and soak his clothes as he's walking across this field. And he sees a light and he sees a village ahead. And you would think that a, a person who has just gotten back from something fantastic like that would look for the police or the press or, you know, the governor or... I have phone. <laughs> yeah, phone. Call somebody. Yeah, I'm back. I'm okay. But instead, it's beautiful. He finds this village. He's walking in the rain through this meadow and he's being washed and he walks soaking wet into a pub. And it describes the yellow light and the warmth of the fire and the conversation. And he walks up to the bar. The last line in the book is, a pint of bitters, please. One of the most understandable <laughs> actions a man has ever done. Another one would be, I love the Lord of the Rings movies and think they're amazing. What they can't do because it's film, is linger. And yet what Tolkien is committed to doing is lingering in the various intriguing dimensions of his world. You know, I remember reading it for the first time. Sauron is destroyed. The kingdom is restored. And then kind of looking at where my bookmark is and going, there's like a hundred pages left. <laughs> what is the rest of this story about? Yeah. How interesting can that be? And then it went, oh, but it's extraordinary because, you know, one of the next scenes is Aragorn on the judgment seat of the king, which will radically reframe your expectations around that if you engage that a little bit and go, he is not mostly there to get people in trouble. He is mostly there to set things to right with witnesses and not just like, yeah, you did a heroic thing and you know that God has acknowledged you, so you're okay. But to go, the soldiers who did heroic things during the Battle of Pelennor Fields are called forward. Yes. And in front of people, yes. what, it, what they've done is explain to them. And there's one in particular. He saves Faramir, but he leaves his post to save Faramir. And so, you know, Aragorn explains, you left your post and for a man of the guard of Minas Tirith, the penalty is death. And so now hear your doom. And then he assigns him to be Faramir's right-hand man in the city that's being entrusted to Faramir. And you and your people will live there with you and just go, wow, the depiction of trustworthy power on a throne, setting things to right yes. publicly and just going, yes, that 
would be great. Not just for me, but I want to watch. Exactly. Yeah. The rewards, the stories told. Little footnote on that, Luke, who is studying, among other things, medieval literature and poetry. In all of the medieval classics, when the warriors return back from these great adventures, their tale is told, but it is told with witnesses. Mm. A feast is held, and it's not, he did great things, welcome home. It is a long narrative around what they did and what it cost them with those people yeah. who were witnesses to it or rescued by it, there to participate in it. And I think that's where Tolkien got that because he was so steeped in that as well, that rich retelling and that justice dispensed. Yeah, it's beautiful. And sometimes I, I think it helps us to have something tangible on our desk, on a bookcase, something that we can see regularly that invites us into a posture of wonder and imagination. And I heard this story the other day, and this to me is a, a it's just when I hear it, it makes my heart sore. It's from J.J. Abrams, who's the co-creator of Lost, the TV show, but he also did the most recent Star Wars. So he was the one who oversaw that. And he's talking at a TED Talk about creativity. And one of the things he says is, on a shelf in his office, he has, and he shows it, and it's a box that looks about like the size of a shoebox, and it has a big question mark on it. And it's called the Magical Mystery Box. And he bought this at a magic shop when he was a boy. And it was supposed to be filled with like dozens of unexpected wild things. And he's never opened it. So he, since he's since boyhood, he's had this. And what he said is, for me, the sense of wonder and infinite possibility is what this represents. Mm. And so I want to keep it on the shelf to draw me to wonder and to imagination and creativity. And for him, actually opening that box, he would see it, be done with it, and it would have long been forgotten. But it made me think, well, okay, what is it in my life that I have mm. somewhere that regularly reminds me, step into wonder and mystery? And I don't have to have all the answers, but I have to have the desire mm. to wonder. Mm. So, friends, here's our counsel. Start thinking about this. Start wondering. Start filling those empty file folders in the soul. Uh, look for pictures. Go through magazines. You should do this with your friends or your small group or your family. Get a bunch of magazines, uh, you know, a whole genre of things from cooking magazines to adventure, outdoor stuff, nature, get, you know, National Geographic, all that. And go through, have everybody go through and just randomly cut out pictures that speak, and you will be amazed at how it's worth a thousand words. It really is. And so I've begun to do that. So I have a journal now that is my Hoping in the Coming Kingdom journal, and I have pictures in there, and I have narratives. The horse narrative is going in there now. And then to let your own longings, what do you want? Just journal on that. I can't wait to long walks with Jesus. But where? Talking about what? Like, drive into it. Be specific. Write these things down. And then I would also recommend in this hour, because what we are doing is we are going to war against hopelessness. We are going to war against being trapped in the present. Ask Jesus for his hope. Ask Jesus, mm -hmm. Jesus, I need your hope. I need your hope. I need a supernatural help here. I need you to breathe into it. So let's do that right now. Let's just pray. Romans says that we abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, I need your hope. Share your hope with me. Breathe your hope into my mind and into my imagination. Breathe your hope into my heart. Jesus, shatter the power of the darkness and the hopelessness that is sweeping the earth. Holy Spirit, I need your help. Help me to abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I need help, God. 
rescue me from the darkness, bring me into the light, flood me with expectations of the wonderful that are concrete and tangible and real and are very personal to me. Not generic, not one for all, but very, very specific to me. I need your help. Flood me with your hope, Jesus. Empower me, Holy Spirit. Amen. That concludes our series, Expecting the Wonderful. I hope you'll join us next week when we start a brand new series. It's on how to tell your story, how to convey and share the story of your life with others, and also, and equally important, how to listen well to the stories of others. We'll begin that next week. I hope you will join us for it. You've been listening to the Ransom Tart Podcast.